Welcome to Team Stay. Can you guys all say Team Stay on three? One, two, three. Team Stay! Hi, I'm Marianne. Welcome to Team Stay. Today we're at JMU with Coach Adam Perrin. D1 soccer coach and recruiter. This is the guy you want to know. Thanks for talking to us today. Yes, how are you, Marianne? Good. Yeah, welcome. So, welcome, thanks. everyone, to uh, James Madison and everyone from Team Say. We're uh, really excited to have you here and show you around the place a little bit. And D1 soccer. Yeah. So, most sought out soccer team for a lot of Virginia teens. Yeah, yeah, Pretty especially excited. lately. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we've had a lot of success and it's been a program with a lot of tradition, so we certainly get a lot of interest from. Uh, from young males hoping to be able to play here someday. Yes. Game ready, D1. Oh my gosh, the competition is high, huh? Yes, yeah, very. Tell me, tell me the numbers. How many people are on the team? How many new ones do you take every year? Yeah, so uh, right now our, our roster consists of about 31 players. Uh, we'd like to get that down to somewhere in the 26, 27 range. Um, being about 23, 24 field players and four goalkeepers. Um, mainly we'd like to have that kind of consistency within the roster so every single player feels that they have a path uh, development wise to be able to play um, and get onto the field. We try not to keep bigger rosters um, like some other universities because if a kid finds himself a little bit deeper on the roster, um, then it's harder for them really to find that window to getting on the field. And ultimately, I think every kid who loves the game, uh, especially when they come here, they want to play and they want to yeah. be a part of it and they want to feel like they have an impact um, on our season, on our success and everything. Um, to, your, to your point about being game ready, I Game think it, right. <laughs> I love that answer. Yeah, I think it means something differently to everyone. You yeah. know, my personal opinion uh, and what we look for out of our players and even recruits alike is just consistency, uh, consistent men mental focus and attitude um, every time they step on the field and how they act and how they conduct themselves. Um, for us specifically when we're recruiting, we look for one dynamic quality um, in a player. If it's excessive speed or physical attributes or leaping ability, shooting ability, passing, whatever the, the skill might be, uh -huh. um, something that they're just kind of better than the rest of that um, and next level. Um, other than that, other coaches will talk about oh, athleticism and, and height and weight and all these other things. And for me, if the kid can play and he works hard and he feels comfortable at the level, he's consistent and ultimately a good person at the same time to fit within our team culture, um, then those kind of factors for me go into the idea of being game ready. But you are getting a player that was the best in Northern Virginia? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So uh, he's actually, by Gatorade's uh, admission, um, the player of the year in the state. And that oh. goes for basically all the non-academy club and high school talent. Um, they get assessed based on the season. And he specifically had, I want to say, 32 or 33 goals and a multitude of assists. And he was named the Gatorade uh, player of the year for Virginia. Um, wow. which is given out to the best player in every state. So, so Clay Barr is coming here, and as you probably can figure, we don't hold any one recruit higher than the others. We're very lucky to have all of them coming in, and I know we'll of talk course. more about some specifics about some of the other guys that we have coming in, but always sweet to get that um, Gatorade Player of the Year of the state over the, the big monsters like Virginia and Virginia Tech and even VCU and some of those other schools. It's certainly a proud thing for the recruiting piece, and you know, as the recruiting coordinator, um, you know, I, I know Coach Paul trusts a lot in me to help him find good talent, and, and we do it as a group. Um, but there's always a certain amount of pride whenever we can um, get good talent like that to come here. So we're very blessed that, to have him here along with the other guys that will be joining us, the other eight guys as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's go on a tour. want to interact with the with the player you want to hear from the player you don't want to hear as much from their parents because you're not going to be coaching the parents right. you know, at the end of the day so could an obnoxious parent turn you away from a kid 100%. you want really 100 percent. you didn't even hesitate yeah, on that no and, and that's 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 <laughs> the biggest guide i can give because i i feel bad for some kids because i've gone I've to different this now. yeah <laughs> yeah no i've gone to camps in different places and you talk about coaches talking and I 100% the other day I was at a camp and they were saying you don't really want to mess with him he's got a helicopter dad or a helicopter uh, mom and some of the club coaches will tell me that too any player that we're interested in here James Madison yeah. I always call the club coach to get a character reference on the kid because our culture is very important to us so if they say yeah. he doesn't train hard he's got a bad attitude if there's yeah. red flags we won't take him here no matter if they're a national team player or whatever they are but 
if the club coach tells me, yeah, his parents really on him, or like if they cause us a problem through the recruiting process, yeah. then that could be some red flags down the road. Because once in a while you have parents call or email when they're in college, and those are things that you don't want. So you can Ooh. tell I speak passionately about this, but the biggest thing I tell families, even when I coach club soccer, love your kid, be the biggest fan for them, cheer for them, support them, even when they fail, don't be too hard on them, like hold them accountable, but help them guide them through. Yeah. But don't coach them, don't tell them what to do on the field. Um, their coach is there for that. And sometimes a coach will give a command, kick it, shoot it, and they might be 40 yards from goal and it's not a good shot. Or they might say the reverse pass it and it's an opportunity for the kid to shoot it because he's close enough, you know? Yeah. So I think a kid needs to learn and grow in those situations and find solutions for themselves. And the parents, like I said, they can be the loudest cheerleaders ever and be huge fans for their kids. But in my personal opinion, I think they just need to kind of stay out of some of that process a little bit more um, and allow that child to be able to grow and mature and go through some of that themselves, but learn from mistakes and failures and whatnot. Right, become independent. to like drive to UVA before we play him this year but we watch a ton of video through that instat platform um, the video software and then I'll create uh, kind of an offensive defensive game plan as we implement it in training and it's kind so, of like final reminders like a review before the test if you will so tell us about game day what do you do before a big game yeah no it's a good question there's a lot that typically goes into it um, Leading up in the morning, very first thing, uh, the players will come up here about 9 o'clock. We'll meet as a group. We typically get them breakfast sandwiches, uh, so we feed them, which is always important for 18 to 23-year-old young men. <laughs> Bottomless um, pits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to keep them focused especially. But um, a lot of planning goes into each match, a lot of preparation. And basically through training each and every day, we come up with a game plan, basically how to attack a team offensively, um, how to prevent against their kind of best attributes in attack and their character as a group. Um, so, uh, i.e. like a defensive game plan. And then this is like kind of the, the final reminders, uh, final kind of study, study guide before the test is I hand all the players um, a detailed scout that will have all the pictures, uh, personal information about each player regarding like their playing characteristics, their best foot, their weakest foot, um, their weaknesses in either their passing, their dribbling, their comfortable on the ball, their lack of work ethic. Try to get specific about the team as a, as a group. And things How do you well. get that information? We watch a lot of video. Uh, we have a software program that um, we can watch pretty much every game during the course of the season from those opponents that we have. So if we have a game on a Saturday, we usually start training, um, preparing for our next team probably like Thursday or Friday, mm -hmm. start watching film. Um, we all get together as a staff and talk about the thoughts that we want to put down for the guys. And then from there, um, we devise that game plan that we hand out to them. Um, so give them all a profile there. We go through everything. And then once we get through that other team's kind of personality and traits and what they like to do, um, I will usually typically talk to the team about our tactics, um, whether it be different type of offensive build patterns that we want to use to try to break the other team down because we play in a possession system. This is a very simple kind of exercise. I know I can't really use numbers or specifics, yeah. but it's a simple pattern involving um, our center backs being able to find a midfielder between the lines, playing off to kind of our holding mid who's facing forward. And then ideally the fastest way to point A to point B is a straight line. So we try to get forward passes um, into our center forward and then being able to play and link off of him to eventually break lines down. So again, I, I go into more detail um, right. specific to our team and the opponents that we're playing. But this is kind of a similar chart. I never was an art major in college or anything, so uh, <laughs> you guys can bear with me. But um, just something unique that we try to do That's and make great. sure the guys yeah, understand and give them some ideas to, to, uh, to solve the opponent. Do the players ever say, like, do they come up with their own plays or say, well, can you do it this way or can we do it that way? Do they ever put their input in just yeah. out of curiosity? No, of course. You deal with Division One players. There's some egos that come along with it, and they're all coming from a very high-level background. So they always ask questions. And from yeah. their past coaching and people that have told them one way, but when you come into any program, any university, um, it, you've chosen that coach's way and how they want to do things. Um, so for here, we kind of have a, a guide to how we want to do things offensively and defensively, and we go right. through that in training. But once it gets to a certain point, we want the guys to be creative, to be fluid, to express themselves and use their instinct um, because you can't 
train track guys. Uh, I yeah. call them like train track them to make them go here when the ball's here. We allow them freedom and flexibility. We just try to give them ideas um, within that um, and just, just kind of new ways of thinking. Remember when we talked and I invited you to do this interview with us, do you remember why? Um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was to try to um, just kind of build awareness about the recruiting process to help families out um, and being able to better navigate how to get more exposure for some kids at a young age to the Division One game and or uh, if Division One doesn't work out, providing families with other avenues, other options and maybe education about um, some other opportunities that are out there. Perfect. Pretty wow. Good. Yeah, Pretty good memory. Great. Great memory. <laughs> exactly. Because um, what I've heard on the sidelines, um, I have kids that have played soccer and on the sidelines, you just hear parents um, you know, I don't want to give them names, but you know, sure. just certain kinds of parents, you know, giving each other advice like, oh my gosh, you have to have footage for this. You should have been playing club at five years old. Oh my gosh, don't play high school, but play, play club. And there's just so much controversy over what is really needed and what's not. And then these kids are, you know, hearing certain things from their high school coaches or certain things from their club coaches. And then they're hearing their parents say, no, 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 you know, and then their peers, forget it. Oh yeah. no, you know, my coach said, or my mom said, my dad said, you know, yeah. and then um, you've got the parents coaching on the sidelines, <laughs> you know, and the coach yeah. is telling them one thing and the dad's like, no, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I, put together some questions just yeah. to clear up some of the controversy yeah. about what a D1 coach, what a D1 recruiter is looking for. Sure. Um, hope I can help you guys out. <laughs> I hope so too. So tell us first, what's the difference between D1, D2, and D3? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, good, uh, that's a good first question. I think you told us what D1 is already. That's game ready. Yeah, no, that's being, <laughs> being game ready. But a big difference between the three divisions comes within um, like the athletic scholarship piece to it. Division one universities. That was my next question. <laughs> oh yeah, so it'll segue into, into both. Good. Division one universities um, can offer out a maximum of 9.9 .9 athletic scholarships to be able to disperse how each individual school sees um, over probably 28 to 30 players. Um, I get a lot of families that ask about full rides and can I get a full ride and everything else and we can speak more specifically about kind of what it takes to earn that um, but that's can out there they? for division yeah for the right player a lot of it's on okay. talent ability need for the team um, basically uh, very hard to get ride, very 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 hard to get I think a lot of families maybe a little bit uneducated about kind of the concept of that but think about 30 players on a team and only being able to give out 9.9 .9, whereas basketball has 14 football has I believe 80 or 85 yeah so, why is that that was one of my questions like why does why does football get more than soccer yeah I mean uh, that might be above the, the, the pay grade maybe because they do have kind of an offense a defense a special team just more positions it is a violent sport so I think there's some attrition piece there so if kids go down there's other high level players that come on and take their place um, basketball I've never understood because you need maybe eight guys I feel like to be a, a a really talented team and you got yeah. 14 on scholarship so in men's division one college soccer you can't even build a full starting 11 with full rides so you have to be really creative about how you um, disperse those now in division two it's also so 9.1 is what you said 9.9 .9. oh 9.9 .9. yeah okay um, division two you get uh, 9.0 so it goes down slightly, but most Division twos have about nine scholarships. That's another scholarship. Full uh, scholarships? Level. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. For sports? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And but D2 is tricky. There's a, so at the JMU camp, we saw uh, Shippensburg, which was okay. a D2 school. But otherwise, aren't most of them in California? They're all over the place. I used to coach at Division II, uh Southern New Hampshire, uh, in my past. Oh, that okay. is up in New Hampshire, and it's one of the best Division II programs actually in the country. So there's a lot in New England, in the Northeast, in the Mid-Atlantic. There okay. actually is a good um, bunch in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. It's a really good conference kind of in that area. And then California, we, too? California's a bunch, yeah. So okay. the Midwest gets lost so a little bit. So all the kids want to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone wants to go to California. They don't mind not making D1. Are we going to California? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, that, so that's kind of how it's scattered, but there's 210. Division two programs in, oh, in all. Wow. There's, there's 205, I believe, Division ones, and then okay. Division three. There's no athletic aid, despite what some parents like to say. Okay. My child got a full athletic scholarship. That's impossible because there aren't any in Division three. Only academic money and financial um. aid, and there's about um, 
I believe, 400 Division three programs out there, which I've coached in Division three in the past. So it's a good kind of difference of all of all the levels. Wonderful. So explain the levels. We've got the scholarships down now. Explain the levels. How does how does that how does it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think for Division three programs especially, some of the top programs in the country they can beat some Division one teams. You look at programs and universities such as in Messiah, who's won. I want to say six or seven of the last 15 national championships. You have programs wow. like Tufts in Boston, who's a NESCAC school that can have um, really, really high academic uh, programs in the heart of Boston, can provide a really good student experience. And they also get a lot of those D1 kind of tweener players that may not quite fit in at some of the Division ones, but they come to that school, they have a good college experience, and they're still very good players that mesh to create um, a very good soccer team. So Division three, I would say overall as a whole, um, maybe a little less athletic from player one to player 20 is division one. I think that's what you get at the division one level is um, any of your team is, is athletic, you know, right. be it a smaller guy that's fast and strong or a bigger guy that can just cover some ground. Um, I could say about division two is somewhere in between both. You know, there's some very good division two levels at the top, but as you get kind of lower in the division two level, the level will drop off. Some of the programs aren't fully funded. So they're not working with the full 9.0 in Division II. Some of them are working with three scholarships or two scholarships. So it makes it very hard to compete. And then you get to Division I, and I think the biggest difference is um, there's a lot of parity in Division I. So the number one team in the country could play the 205th team and lose just because that 205th team could have just as good of an athlete and on their day be able to beat them. Whereas in those other divisions, typically the top five are a lot better than the bottom you know, tier. So I think that's kind of a big difference between the levels, for my personal opinion. Very important, your personal opinion. No, that's why we're here. <laughs> yes, yeah. Parents and teens want to hear what you have to say. Sure. So at what age do we see their talent? I mean, most kids in Northern Virginia are playing from when they're like four years old. And their parents already say, you know, oh, they're going to be, you know, pro soccer players or <laughs> pro football players. And, yes. they, and they spend all their money yeah. in all their training for years. So what's a realistic age that you really, you know, see that these kids are all really D1 material for yeah, soccer? I mean, so much of their bodies, as you know, can change. I know you have, have kids. So yeah. from, from when they're 8, 10, 12 years old to yeah. when they're uh, 14, 16, 18 years old. You know, me personally, I played with teammates when I was 12 or 13 that you launch the ball forward and they run past everyone because they're just faster and more athletic. But then as they get older and everyone catches up to that speed and athleticism that maybe some of those kids are abnormally fast, what other traits are they learning? What are some other ways that they're learning to solve problems within the game context? Um, so when everyone catches up athletically and becomes the same size, they're still developing their game so they can accomplish what they need to. You know, if it's a defender still winning tackles or an attacking player scoring goals. Um, for us, you know, we'll typically try to identify players probably around like 15 or 16 years old Sure, if I see a 14-year-old uh, at a camp that's, um, you know, blowing it up and is yeah. better than everyone else, uh, then we'll kind of write his name down and keep him in mind for the future. Yeah. But as we'll get into later, we can't really contact them or do anything at that point, so it's more just to wait and see and watch if he plays on this specific club team. I'll try to make sure I see them play it at another tournament or whatnot. But our main range to start identifying players, at least for this recruiting cycle right now, is, is 2021. So going into their junior year, okay. you know, for us personally as a program at James Madison, that will really ramp up and identify players. But I'd say between 14, 15, 16 years old is when parents should be able to start to tell what talent their, their young child has, boy or girl, and if they'd have a shot at uh, Division One soccer. So what about the parents that are spending millions of dollars on, you know, <laughs> Individual training, they're, they're just, I mean, they're going to town, you know, yeah. running coaches, uh, sure. all kinds of coaches yeah. to get them where they need to be. Um, so I guess, so the question there is, um, at what age, like, so they're playing with their friends and they're just on a regular, I don't want to name names, but like a regular team, a team. Regular well, like a regular team. Yeah. Yeah, team in their area, yeah. you know, and then the higher, which we're going to get into the higher club teams, you know, are being sought after from other parents. And the one mom says, no, 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 no. You know, this is just fun for us. We're just going to play here. And mm -hmm. other parents are like, if you do that, you know, your kid's not going to be on the high school team 
you know, in a few years. Sure. You got to get serious, yeah. you know. And then they're putting the pressure on the kid. Yeah. You know, we got to play on that team. Yeah. So, when should they really be thinking that way? Yeah, I think at times, no offense to like the parents, but sometimes I feel like they can be a little bit too involved. You know, I think with all these coaches, and I had some specific goalkeeper coaching when I was young, because I was a goalkeeper um, in my career. And I, for me, I really... We have to get into that, too. Yeah, we have we to hear about sure. your career, yes. <laughs> for me, I really love the game. I mean, I play a lot yeah. of different sports. I played basketball, I played tennis, I played golf. Like, like every young kid does in America, you play all these different things. True athlete. But yeah, yeah but well there rounded. are sports that... <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But there were sports that really stuck out to me, and soccer was one of those sports, and I wanted to train and get better. I think some of these parents, they want it so bad for their children, either because maybe they didn't get to themselves or they were a star athlete and they want their child to be that so they can kind of have the bragging rights. But no matter what individual coach that they get the child or whatnot, um, if they don't want it enough to put the full effort and energy into those exercises, if it's a running coach, if it's an agility coach or a soccer coach, yeah. um, they're not going to really improve or get to that point. So they have to come into that. And I think I'm all for a 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old having a running coach and learning the right way to run because at those ages you're having your formational habits because some kids have bad habits and once they're in their teen years it's harder to break them of those so if they get the proper training sure it could mean an extra step or an extra um you know a piece of strength but a lot of it's genetics and, and a lot of times you can't fight those genetics so um but yeah i would say you know if the kid loves what they do especially in the soccer realm um, you want to put that child in the best environment possible. So whatever club team that meant, if it was an academy system, if it was a club system, again, which we can get into more detail if you like. Um, but also, I think what kids don't do enough these days is just playing on their own. I think mm. everyone knows that it's, it's video game central and it's all these social media outlets. And right. that's, in my opinion, where the, the, the country is lacking is not enough kids are just getting out and just playing Two on two, one on one, three on yeah. three, in the side yeah. yards, in the backyards. And me growing up in a Portuguese family, that's all I did growing up was get in the backyard, play 2v2, someone scores a goal, you jump in the pool and you have fun with it. But oh, cool. a lot of those formative years were spent without coaching. Um, and, and, and that's where I think players can really develop. But then we can get into some of the, the club and specifics with coaching yeah. and that kind of thing as well. Awesome. So on that note, how do we pick a club team? How do we know what a good club team is because they all claim to be the best and yeah. are there letters or there numbers like yeah. how does it go <laughs> well, there's all sorts of leagues and i know we talked about before yeah I and that's the other word so there are leagues clubs yeah and, uh, there's cups there's yeah there's, there's a lot going on even as a recruiting well, coordinator well, to keep everything straight can yeah. get a little hairy but there's a lot of different leagues like they have this academy league and they have ecnl they have ccl they have a new uh usl kind of developmental league that's coming open so you know speaking of generalities for me, um, it is about finding the right fit. I know part yeah. of your, your question was kind of how some of these clubs, you know, they'll offer, you know, one-time training uh, opportunities. You know, I used to be a club coach in the academy myself, and if a kid reached out to me with some interest, I would let him come to a training session. And that would do two things. That would, one, um, allow the child and his family to see how I coach, can hear the information, he can get used to the players, he can see the level of the players, and try to figure out and self-assess if he fits in with that level, if he'll be challenged, if he'll be too good. Because yeah. if you're always the best player in a club, I think to a certain degree that can be okay, but you want to be in the most challenging environment possible. You don't necessarily want to be the best at those formative years because um, if you're never challenged, you're not growing. If you're not failing, you're not growing. And, and then they get to a higher level and they're like a deer in the headlights, like, yes. whoa, yeah. where did these guys come from? Yeah. I was the best. Yeah, yeah I've college seen that soccer, yeah. division one, two, and three, regardless of where you go, it's a big jump because you go from yeah. being one of the better players on your club or high school into a situation where you're dealing with 22, 23 year olds, some from international countries or Germany, Sweden, Africa, uh, yeah. Mexico, Central America, wherever, or South America to where now the speed quickens up. And if you haven't been in those kind of um, harder environments, tougher environments, then it could be a little bit more of a curve, like a steeper curve to be able to adjust. So I would recommend when kids get to 15, 16, 17, if they can get into amateur, um, either men's league, or they have these NPSL or USL2 leagues um, that a lot of our players will play in in the summers. Um, and, and if a teenager plays in those leagues, yeah. now they're getting used to and more comfortable with playing against older players. So when they get to one of these colleges that we've talked about, um, it's not as big of a jump and it's not as big as a wow factor of, wow, this pace, the speed, the strength of these guys. Like it, yeah. It's tough, you know. So we heard a coach say, um, 
uh, that ninth grade was the time that you started going to the college ID camps um, and you know trying to get information from them on your area and what they recommended. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think with the rule changes in the NCAA, um, you know, it makes it a little tricky sometimes and for families even now to figure out the process because there's a new rule that says if you're a freshman or a sophomore in high school, yeah. we can't have any interaction with you uh, pretty much outside of camps. Um, and even at camp, we can't have any specific recruiting talk. So for example, uh, you're a ninth grader. If you called me on the phone right now, yeah. I'd have to ask what, what year you were. Oh, I'm a ninth grade coach. And I have to say, I'm really sorry, but I can't talk to you. Uh, um, I can reach out to you June 15th, going into your junior year. So right now for this summer, as of June 15th, I can talk to rising juniors legally. We can talk, we can email. And right. then they can start to visit, um, well, I believe August 1st is the date that they can actually have an unofficial visit on campuses. They can visit campus on their own. They can take tours as early as 8th, ninth, 10th grade. Okay. They just can't go into the coaches' offices and have a, a specific conversation or even really interact with them. So to your point with the ID camps, um, yeah. we'll have some uh, ninth and 10th graders that come to our ID camp. Yeah, I saw some at your camp. Yeah, so observed. we have some other yeah. guys. Yeah, so that's a good job. But I did on. hear you all tell them that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of the conversations we can't be And with they'll the, change so much from ninth grade so to much. junior yeah. year. Yeah. You can see how they are as a player. You can see yeah. their technical ability, their vision, yeah. their knowledge of the game, their IQ. Yeah. But that kid in six months or a year yeah. could hit a little spurt and it can, can become completely different. So I think it's good for they them. Start to, benching. Yeah, start benching and the curls and everything else. So exactly. I think they can um, still come to camp. They can get some coaching. They can put themselves in those environments, but um, they shouldn't feel um, you know upset or, or down if they don't get an email or call just because coaches really can't. Now Division threes have less stringent rules, so they can reach ah. out whenever. So they don't have a kind of an age time. So if they saw a ninth grader and ah. they really liked him, they could start the process. Even that's a little bit too young to start. But, but they I could still give them feedback. They could give the parents feedback. They can give them feedback. They can give parents feedback. We okay. have to give be a little bit more careful with what feedback yeah. we gave. For example, if you had a ninth grader that came to camp, yeah. um, you know, we could give them as much soccer feedback as we could and help them become a better player, but we couldn't speak to them anything about James Madison or, or our program or anything recruiting at our university. Okay. But you could tell them how they played. Could tell them how they played. We could give them tips on how they could get better, what they could improve upon. But yeah, I just can't make it specific to our university. Well, that's good though. That's yeah. Good for, now, so would you talk to the parents and the and the kids, or do you want to just talk to the kids? How does that work? Yeah. When they're younger, I know it changes yeah. as they get older. When they're younger, parents still have a big influence on those ages. Obviously, the, the formative ages, as we always call it in, in soccer, but. We, if a parent wants more clarity on what their child can work on, certainly they can come up to us in camp as long as it's not combative or anything and, yeah. and realize that it's just our opinion on what we see as yeah. all of us came from our different backgrounds and been coaching a long time. But sometimes you talk to a child now and it might go in one ear and out the other. Yeah. So if a parent wants some clarity on, you know, hey, you know, what's some um, advice on how he can get better on his kicking? or on yeah. his dribbling or whatnot. And we could speak about some, some exercises or some drills or different things that he can work on just to help that family be able to, you know, best prepare the kid and help them to get, to get better. Um, so oftentimes in that setting, we can talk to parents, we could talk to kids and, and help them out. So a lot of people misconstrue when they're juniors um, what ID camp is. Sure. So I heard you guys say, that they should be looking at it more like a tryout, not a camp, because they could get an offer, right, yeah. after? Absolutely. Um, I think every, every camp works differently, um, but a lot of times, like especially for us, we have this July camp at the end uh -huh. of the month, ID clinic. And the ID clinic process is very strange as it goes to Division One school, Division One school, and other colleges as well. There's some programs that I know they have the kids come and it becomes a little bit of a cash grab for the coaches. Um, and they're not even out there watching and working with the kids. I know specific to us, each of us are out there coaching. We're evaluating, and for us to be able to take a guy into a program that is now top 10, we want to see kids that stand out. We want to see kids right. that are working hard from minute one to the last minute of camp, no matter the exercise. We want to see that consistency, as we talked about being game ready, but consistency across all the 11 v 11 and small side and all the exercises that we do. Um, and then we just want to see them stand out. So if we have 60 kids at camp, ideally, you know, we're going to be trying to pick from the top five or 10 and then even narrow it down to the top two or three. But 15 of our, of our 30 current players have been through our ID camps in the past 
um, either one, two, or, or multiple. Wow. So for our specific school at James Madison, we really use our D camps to identify talent and even find some of those diamonds in the rough uh, at camp. But junior year, I would say, um, and this summer going into junior year, it's very important for families on the recruiting trail. Um, I always recommend going to a few ID clinics specific to your university. Um, I always recommend going to maybe a couple of Division II or Division III just so they can diversify the list of schools that they have. Because I think you have some kids that are really, really good players that will definitely be going to Division I. They're getting letters and emails and calls yeah. from coaches, and they should be able to have that awareness that they know that, that they have their choice of Division I schools. Yeah. And there's some other kids that are really hunting, really fighting, but they've gone to a lot of different programs, some of the top, top ones that you see in the top five, the Virginias or Stanfords. They've gone to some lower camps and lower level camps and some lower um, level conferences, yeah. and they're not getting kind of much interest. And again, they, uh, they shouldn't take it personally, but they should still be looking for the right fit and give the Division twos and Division threes a chance. You know, I personally played Division three. I had a great experience, started probably 75, 80% of the games and went on to play professionally um, from that realm. And I also was close to home. My mom could see my games and I had a good experience that way as well. So oh, sometimes good. Division one isn't always the, the end all, I think, for, for the college process. So before we get on to your career, which I want to hear about, um, tell us what an ID camp means. Yeah, so it's basically an identification um, clinic that we take in. Um, it's open to anyone, any male that from the ages of, I want to say, eighth grade until seniors in high school. We have to open it up to the public so we can't be specific about who we yeah. invite. We have to kind of have that open to everyone. And we utilize this identification camp to find um, top-level talent and prospects that either maybe we missed in either club or academy or, or those high school environments or guys that we want to see a little bit more of. We try here at our program to evaluate kids anywhere from three to five times, so we really get a full assessment of what they are. <clears throat> we could come on one day and make it have the worst game of their lives, and then maybe if we only evaluate them that one time, maybe we missed a really good player, yeah. or vice versa. Maybe a young man just had a really good day and a really good game, but more it's kind of a regression to the mean, and maybe his consistent level isn't quite what we're looking for. So that's why we try to give kids at least three to four opportunities to evaluate them in our camp if we can, and then if we really like them, we try to go and see them for their club team when they're in their own environment, when they're comfortable with their tactics, their coach, you know, everything they've worked on. Because sometimes these identification clinics can be challenging because you're with 50 strangers and new kids mm -hmm. and they play different ways and trying to show off in those settings, um, show your skill set, I should say, can be very challenging. So again, we try to see Especially both. Especially if they come with friends. Because then they're going to pass to their friends and make yeah. their friends look good, right? <laughs> yeah, but I try to, yeah, I try to divide up the friends. So if I see oh, four or five okay. kids on the same team, like I try to uh, mix up the So you guys team. know this little yeah, thing. Yeah, I know what they try to do. They all get into the little clicks when they come. They start knocking around. But we try to make it as comfortable as possible. And I feel like the three of us here have a really good relationship and a lot of continuity. And we try to make people feel very comfortable because it is a family environment here. That's how we conduct our practices is how we are with our guys it's very open door um, you know we love each and every one of them and, and with that love comes some frustration some tough times but through the greatest times and the championship and, and the season that we had um, you're around some people that you really care about and that makes it all the more special so yeah. when kids come on campus we try to make them feel that that same way um, so they feel that comfort when they come here to, to JMU so tell us your background uh, uh, it started a while back you know I grew up in Ludlow, Massachusetts, they call it Little Portugal. My, my great-grandparents are from the Azores, so I have some European roots, you know, way back. Um, but I grew up there, uh, moved to Hamden. I went to prep school at Wilbraham Munson Academy um, out there in, in Western Mass. From there, I went to uh, Colby Sawyer College, which is a small Division three of about 950 kids, 1,000 wow. kids, so everyone kind of knows who you are. They're yeah. not hiding from anyone. But I chose that school because it was close to home. Um, the coach was a German guy that I hit it off with immediately. He at least promised me the opportunity to um, com compete, to start right away as a goalkeeper, which for me, playing time was important. You know, I yeah. think I didn't just want to go to a school and say I was in this program to wear a Division One jacket or Division yeah. II jacket or whatnot. I wanted to go somewhere where playing was an important or the part ring. of it. <laughs> yeah, or the ring. Yeah, no, that's important too. But uh, so from there, um, after my four years, I went on to play in, in USL with West Mass Pioneers, which is a professional team. I played there for three seasons, and along that, uh, in the MASL, which was professional indoor. Um, so I played in Mexico in front of 10,000 people in Baltimore, wow. Philadelphia. I got to travel everywhere, playing for peanuts. We don't pay. We weren't paid a ton 
you know, 250, yeah. 300 a game or whatnot. But to that me, that probably at the time, wasn't, yeah, right. It wasn't important. It was great, yeah. yeah. But, but now you look back and like, man, I wouldn't be able to live off of that. Yeah. Um, but I spent some time in, in Hong Kong and China towards the end of my 20s. Had some tryouts in their top division in Hong Kong just because, like every other kid, I want to try to play overseas and, and continue my career wow. as much as possible. But um, my coaching career started at 25 years old. I was offered a grad wow. assistant position, yeah, nine years ago now, um, at a college called Utica College okay. in New York. So they paid for my master's degree. I was an assistant coach. At that time, I had no idea what I wanted to do with life. My friend just offered me to get a master's and be around the game, and I fell in love with coaching. Um, oh. In a uh, uh, field that I can wear a polo and shorts or a t-shirt and shorts every day and, and, and mentor and guide young men and be able to follow dreams and travel and, and do everything like I wanted to do as a, as a kid and certainly go through some of the turmoil and ups and downs and, and help guide them through those those years uh, of being a college student. and. Um, you know, I, like anyone else, I have little regrets and whatnot about playing and things I wanted to do in college to help prepare me for the pros that I wanted to do. And there's a lot of our players here that have professional aspirations, so I feel like my trials and tribulations have, will better prepare them um, for those opportunities. At least I can tell them what they need to be doing or help guide them, and it's up to them to walk through that open door and to put in the time and effort and energy it takes to be a professional at something in this in this world, but uh, but I'm grateful for my background and, and all the coaching that I've um, been able to have and, and do from that Utica College. I've been at uh, Bridgeton Academy as a prep school. I've been at UMass Amherst, uh, which is Division One. I've been at Ohio State. I coached at Ohio State for a year. Southern New Hampshire in Division Two, Colby in Division Three. So throughout my coaching career, whenever I talk to families about the college process, I've been blessed enough to have coached at every level. So I feel That's like I can awesome. yeah, help guide kids into where I see them and what level I feel like they can go to and also have a good understanding of, uh, of what it takes to, to perform at each level. That's an awesome background. Yeah, it's, it's a, small, a lot of stops. I'm a U-Haul oh. Platinum member, I think, for moving. But <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It keeps life exciting, right? It's, Absolutely. It's Seen a different journey. parts of the country and, yeah, different right. parts of the world. So. Yeah, and I'm sure you're a great mentor, and that's what these kids need. They really do, because one, one person could change their lives. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. I've had a few people in my life that I see as mentors that have helped me as a player, um, but also as a coach, and I certainly see Coach Zensky here as, as one of those. He's 34 years old, just like me, so it's, it's, it must be strange for him kind of having an assistant that's about the same age, but I've learned a lot from him, and, and how we went through this season and his mentality and how he speaks to the guys and um, how he conducts himself as a head coach in the program. I've already learned a lot in hopes that someday I can be a Division One head coach when the time is right. But right now, I'm just going to continue to focus on making this place the best I can. Yeah, you're doing an <laughs> incredible job. Thank Recruiting you so much. Recruiting great guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so is d1 soccer the same for girls that's probably a loaded question or <laughs> yeah no of course i mean i, I think briefly that, i won't make sure. you go there just no, I, haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time in the women's game but i know even the recruiting is different i mean those girls are committing nowadays i mean i say now the general body of young men are committing the class 2020 so just finishing their junior year and haven't seen any 2021 commit yet this is the next probably six months that will start happening but girls before this rule change i mean they were committing as freshmen and sophomores wow. in high school. So that process starts way early. And I couldn't believe it because, again, you can't call those kids at that age yeah. even before this new rule change. So I always wonder kind of how they were able to do that. It's a completely different animal. But that age group, I mean, yeah, and I would even think for women, their bodies might change, their skill set yeah. might change. God forbid they took an injury. How does that impact them? But, yeah, usually the girls tend to commit a little bit sooner than the guys. I mean, maybe that's an adage for, for life. Guys are just aloof and don't know what they want for a while, <laughs> and girls just know right away they want to go to school, A, B, or C. But, but yeah, yeah women's, women's soccer, I think it has some uh, similarities through club team and everyone playing for the right club and figuring that out and what's going to push them on to the best schools. Right. Um, but, yeah, it is a little bit different going from men to women. Okay. So tell us, so they say that um, the kids should not play for, so there's a mix. They okay. should play for their high school and club or just focus on club, and then they say that a lot of injuries come from the high sure. school team. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question, I think, for me, because being in the college game, I don't want to upset any of those coaches. Right, but I, right. I think the development academy in our country is the highest level because that's the, that's the league that holds the MLS teams. And similar to the European model, those MLS teams are training youth to be able to hopefully sign for the pro teams. And some of those MLS teams are producing kids that are signing in Europe before they even go to college. 
Um, wow. So that league, kids will find themselves playing against the best academies. And unfortunately, I can't get specific about teams, but yeah. pretty much any of those teams in the, in the professional league have youth teams. Um, with that said, I think there's a right fit for every kid. So there's a lot of kids that, and I get questions from parents, is it okay to play high school and club and not play academy? And if you go on to an academy team and sit the bench and don't play at all, you're not getting valuable minutes. And I feel the best way to learn for any position of any player is getting in the game, seeing situations, failing, making mistakes, as much as coaches might pull their hair out, is yeah. necessary in development. I mean, even here, we never yell at a player for missing a pass or getting the ball taken from them because that's how they learn. You know, those are teaching moments that we can help them become better. What we do get on them for is if we feel there's a lack of effort um, mm -hmm. or lack of, uh, or just a bad attitude on the field conveying to their teammates and whatnot. Um, but I think that's, that's a very important piece of it too, is finding the right situation. And if it's high school and club, um, that could be important. But I do know a club down here in Virginia goes pretty much year round. So there are players when some of these showcases come around to try to identify themselves if they take an injury playing high school soccer and high school soccer here, if there's been some cancellation and whatnot, you can get three, four games in the span of a week. And certainly your body, um, it's very, very hard in your body. I mean, that's just, that's oh, just scientific. Okay. So, so a body's not made to play three, four, five, 90 minute games a week. Even in college, we have two games a week of 90 minutes and that's kind of pushing it. Um, so at those ages, it's up to each family and, and what they want to do. But if that junior year when they want to really get seen, um, the club model is the most important because college coaches aren't really going to high school games. Very, very rarely will you see um, a big time college coach go to a high school game. Once in a while I might take one in if you get some um, random kid that maybe wrote to you that you, have, you need to see him now or you want to yeah, see him because yeah. he's local. If there's some local high schools that I feel are good, I might go to a game. Um, but your biggest area to find talent is at these different showcases, college showcases, ID clinics, identification clinics, um, and sometimes kids writing to us that are sending us videos and that type of thing. Right, because at the, at the showcases, you really can't see 200 kids at a, at a cup. I mean, it's nearly impossible. So when families yeah. come back and say, Coach, you know, did you <laughs> watch me at the like, showcase? And, yeah, it's, yeah, it's mind blowing. But even yeah. if I go there, I watch a kid for 20 minutes. And what can you really understand 20 yeah. minutes? So when I yeah. send a kid, um, the identification um, stuff, if you will, to come to our camps, that's a guarantee that we'll see you. And then it's up yeah. to you as a player to stand out for us. It's not right. anything that there's excuses or whatnot, like you kind of put up or you, or you be quiet type yeah, of thing at our ID exactly. clinic. So I think that is the best way for us to A, for the kid to show interest in us, that they're taking a, a couple of days to come down and experience what we have. Um, but also it shows them how passionate they are, that, that they want to, again, be at JMU and, and they want to perform. And then, you know, we'll try to, if we like them here, to go and see them for their club uh, from that point as well. The awesome. 200 kids is very hard to see in one, in one sitting. Yeah. <laughs> and you go fun. all over the country, which is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. So do you do that at a certain time? or? Oh, it's all over, the, all over the year. So I'd say right now we're in a little bit of a lull to where I'm working some like, college ID camps, both ours. I was just at William & Mary's. Uh, I go to Virginia Tech next week. So sometimes you get these ID camps that have a couple coaches. Uh -huh. So that's another way that when I go to these camps, I try to find some prospects that we could target from those camps. Um, they may not know much about us at all. They could be coming from all over the country. Mm -hmm. But then as we get into the fall, during the season it becomes more difficult. I'll try to get some, to some training sessions from some local club teams or academy teams. Um, but when you get into the winter, we head to Florida for the academy showcase. And then there's all these different cups. There's a Jefferson Cup and there's all these other showcases. So we've been to California in the summer. Um, and we've been to West Virginia for regionals. Um, so we, in the spring is probably our busiest time just in early summer, getting around and going to all these different places to find kids. Yeah. And you just got back from California, right? Yeah. About a month ago, we went to uh, Southern California to take in some games. So it was fun for some reason. It's and that was ECNL? Year, no, it was, um, Academy. Academy. Development okay. Academy. Yeah. So it was a big awesome. tournament. It was cloudy in about 65. So it's just kind of against what you'd assume would be California, but it was, it was really wow. nice, good soccer, and it was a lot of fun. No wow. humidity like Virginia. No, I know. Yeah, not as bad as here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you have some goodies sitting there, Coach Adam. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us about that ball. That's your big hit today. Yeah, I know a lot of people uh, would wonder what the significance of the soccer ball is, but uh, just as of, I want to say, two months ago, James Madison signed an all-school Nike deal. Wow. Because um, men's soccer. 
was with Adidas for uh, over 20, 30 years in the past. So for me, I'm a huge fan of Nike, and these are $150 soccer balls. So to be able to get to work with these and the same balls the Premier League and all the pros use, it's really exciting for me. So I'm a big Nike fan and excited about this change. Awesome. And the kids will be excited. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For sure. Tell us about that picture. Yeah, so this picture has special significance and meaning to me. It's a picture of myself and the other assistant coach, Nick Melville. Um, a little backstory: uh, I got to coach Nick, I want to say, five years ago now at an all-boys prep school up in Maine. Um, years ago was the first time we kind of came in contact, and I became very close with him after that season, became very close with his family. I ended up playing in a, a semi-pro uh, team with him up in Maine for a few years, stayed with his family for the summer. He lives up in Portland, Maine, so we got to stay like right on the ocean. Nice. Um, and then uh, when I was signed on here, we brought him on to be the volunteer coach. And then when Coach Foley left just a few days before preseason, um, we all got promoted and kind of thrown into that turmoil going into the season. But um, that season culminating with a, a conference championship and everything that we did that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about, um, it was just really special that we got to take that ride and that journey together, you know, since we've known each other for so long and he means so much to me. He's like a younger brother to me. So that's kind of the significance of, of that picture being on top of the mountain of the conference, so to speak. Very nice with the trophy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, to segue that, I guess the, the ring here, this is our championship ring um, from this past season. and It's got some pretty cool, um, you know, diamonds in there and uh, on the side it kind of, Categorizes our 2018 quarterfinal appearance in the NCAA, uh, where we beat two ACC teams, uh, North Carolina and Virginia Tech, on the way to, to making that run. Um, it was one of the best seasons in program history. And again, referring back to some of the unknown and turmoil of the head coach leaving about three days before preseason, it made it even more special um, that we were able to really solidify our um, kind of contracts and status at the school and um, just send the seniors out, you know, really on, on, a, on a high note getting a championship and leaving their career and, and being able to look back on this their four-year experience with something to brag about and something to be proud of as they go into the, the working world. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess this last piece, um, you know, for this year, we wanted to kind of change things up a little bit and, and remarket some things and get a little bit more, uh, some new fads, some new feng shui for everything. So this is kind of hanging in the office. and. All the guys got one of these uh, at the end of the season, at the end of season banquet. Nice. We have another one uh, that's commemorating our NCAA tournament run and NCAA quarterfinals in there. So again, uh, that purple really stands out. So we try to use it as much as possible. And um, this is something that you know we'll be able to kind of hang around in the office, and guys will have at home. And again, it's just memories um, and something you can actually grab as opposed to just something you think about. So those are some special things that I keep in my office and helps to keep me kind of motivated and driven, but not forget where we came from. Exactly. That's awesome. And you have that hat. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, we see all the purple. I love it. Awesome. Well, let's go take a tour. What do you think? Sounds great. Yeah, let's do it. So I have a hard question for you. Oh, no. You asked a few. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I heard a girl say to her boyfriend, oh, my GPA is higher than yours. And I'm going to get in J JMU, no <laughs> questions asked. You might get in for soccer because athletes don't have to have as high of a GPA. Ooh. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what do yeah. you think about that? Yeah, I think it's interesting. It ranges for each school. But obviously, probably something I didn't talk a lot about is the academic side. And the academic side is extremely important. So no matter what he or what guy's aspirations are to be a pro, to play after college or whatnot, we'll never sacrifice academics um, for the team or for, you know, to miss class for training sessions or any of that thing. Well, they have thing. their own tutors and stuff, right? They and do they... have yeah, tutoring, they have academic support. So a lot of Division ones have that set aside to be able to help the balance of the athletic and academic life. That's amazing. Um, yeah, but it can be a lot when you're traveling on the road and you're yeah. flying everywhere. And, and, you know, it's a fun lifestyle, but you still have tests. You still have papers, you still have that academic piece, right. and that's important to ultimately get the job that you want someday, which you'll spend the most time in your life doing, regardless if you're a professional player someday or not. So, we preach the importance of academics to the guys, but in terms of kind of the entry part of things and the admissions part, um, for our program specifically, we do have slots. <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah, we, yeah, we do have slots that we can work with guys. So, I think. 
for the average student, non-athlete, it can be very competitive to get into JMU. Very. Yeah. Um, there might be a player or two that wouldn't get in on their own if we didn't assist them. We can never guarantee admissions. We're not supposed to say that to players, but as right. long as they have, um, at least for our program, at least from say a 2.7 to a 4.0, obviously anywhere in that range, okay. we can typically help them get through and we assist them through the process. Under that can get a little bit dicey. But every school's admissions process is different. Ivy League sometimes have different um, criteria. Harvard, I don't know how much like support they have for their athletes. If they're not a good student, they might not be able to get them yeah. in. Yeah. But if that girlfriend I, is talking to the boyfriend and everything else, I would say hopefully he's a good soccer player and we can help him out so we can <laughs> quiet quiet her down. But yeah, we, we, help exactly. our, we help our recruits get in if it's the right kid. And that's a part, um, that's a part of the identification process is making sure that they're a good fit on the team and culture. And then we can look at their transcripts. They send us their transcripts during the recruiting process so we can evaluate those. Mm -hmm. And then through evaluation uh, of their transcripts, we can identify if they can get into school. Awesome. And, you know, some of these high school guys aren't really focused on their academics in high school. They just have so much going on, some of them. Yeah. And then they get to college, and they're getting, like, 4.0s. They're focused on their sport. They're focused on their academics. Yeah. You know, especially a school like JMU, I'm sure it's yeah. important. And now they're starting to think the future. Yeah. So I think that that could work out for them, you no, know, absolutely. to turn the light on and start working yeah. and realizing there's more to life, you yeah. know. Um, Most definitely. Like, I think that's my biggest regret, I'd say, from my high school. Is I was an okay student, yeah. but I didn't realize the importance and how it can impact the missions decisions by just being a average or above average student because there is academic scholarship that each university not every university has yeah. for jmu it's very difficult to get academic money but other places that i've coached and colleagues that i have you can apply to a school like and a it D3 can help with the school. cost yeah, yeah because here in state it's twenty three thousand. yeah it's very affordable very, as yeah. opposed to those other colleges out there that are approaching seventy thousand oh, per year so any wow. academic aid that you can help with families and make the education better and sometimes that helps in the recruiting process because some coaches might not want to invest athletic aid in a player yeah but if he can come to the school for free you know we call it, um, be able to make it work through financial aid and through ac uh, academic money, yeah. then we'll take on that player, or school A, B, or C will take on that player. So grades are extremely important in finding time for that, but I agree with you, often when they get here, you have so many things going on that you have to find time for academics, so time yeah. management. I was always a better student during the season because I knew practice, game, got to find time for my homework. Exactly. Is Virginia, um, or my final question, is Virginia one of the biggest um, soccer states? I would say, again, I think this might be an opinion question, but I would say like California, Texas, Florida, and then I would say like Virginia, North Carolina. Oh, really? are Yeah, so I came from Massachusetts in my past, obviously, as I said before, and there's good players there, but probably not as many as, say, yeah. Northern Virginia near the beach, you get some good players, the Gatorade Player of the Year is from that, that beach area. Okay. Um, but this state has always been known as a real high level soccer state. I mean, University of Virginia won how many national championships right. years ago? Like, you can always find high quality talent in the state. And for us being a public school at JMU, like that'll always be the first place we look is high quality Virginia talent. And then we cast our net outside of that, so. That's awesome. Yeah. And you wanna tell us one last thing about the ring? Oh, I could. I didn't bring it out here, but oh, that's it, okay. We yeah. have pictures of it. Yeah. Tell us about that ring. So they get the ring <laughs> after. How do they earn that ring? Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult to earn. I mean, obviously for those boys, I know it's a little bit cliche, but it takes uh, years and years up to that point of commitment, sacrifice, hard work. I mean, to get to a Division One level, as you folks have probably gotten engaged, is very difficult. You're in the one percent or less of, of a lot wow. of soccer players in the country. And then once you're here, you got to fight against, in our conference, to get the ring. Um, I want to say there's 10 teams in our league, potentially. Don't quote wow. me on that, but some great schools, William & Mary, UNC Wilmington, Drexel, Elon, um, Northeastern, a few other ones, and they're all fighting for the same prize. So you get every team's best, best effort on 7 o'clock on a Saturday night, and to be able to compete and work through some of the injuries and some of the strain and Preseason fitness will be coming up soon, and it's a lot of trials and tribulations. But um, yeah, in the end, in, in early November, when we won in a penalty shootout, um, to understand that we were going to the NCAA tournament and guaranteed that, but also at the end of the season to go to our end of season banquet and be able to celebrate and enjoy it as a family, as a group, to see the look on the players' faces, to have a, a piece of hardware. It's all about the memories, but the piece of hardware that yeah. reminds you of that, and that the kids will always have to, to be happy and to show to their kids someday and their families and be proud of. 
I mean, it's symbolic and it's really special. So it takes a lot of hard work and sacrifice to earn that ring. And now we have to do it all over again because I always like to say success is never final, failure is never fatal. So that's always like a quote that I talk to the guys about. That's so now's a new quote. season, it'll all be forgotten and we got to try to do it again. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This yeah. has been wonderful. And I hope you all got a lot of information from Coach Adam and that you can build and train and become D1 if that's your goal. Or a good college player. Or, one, two, or three. Exactly. <laughs> or play soccer. Follow your passion. Don't change your passion just to get into the school you want. Do what you love. Absolutely. <laughs>